Slicing pie is an equity model for dividing up equity in early stage companies. And the problem with equity splits today is, for the most part, and then slicing pie has been around for 10 years, but the problem with most equity splits is they rely heavily on our guesses about future events, our predictions of future events. Who's gonna put money up? Who's gonna do the work? Whose ideas are more valuable than others? So we have to predict what these things are gonna be in the future. Well, nobody that I know can predict the future very well. So mm -hmm. you're automatically gonna pick the wrong number. What's up? This is Elric Moses Ong, and today I'm going to be interviewing Mike Moyer. Now, if you do a Google search on Mike Moyer, you can see um, he has this website called Slicing Pie, and that's what I'm going to be interviewing him about. Okay, so he has this Wikipedia article where he is actually a lecturer at Northwestern University and all that. And I've even seen his YouTube videos of him speaking at Stanford University talking about um, startup equity speak. Okay, now to give you a quick background, because I just read his book uh, about a week ago, and to give you a quick background about what Slicing Pie is, is that they have a concept called dynamic a dynamic model so um, a lot of startups what what they do is that they split the equity let's say um 50 50 okay so let's say like oh um since we're gonna get get into a partnership let's just do 30 70 or 60 40 or 50 50 or whatever okay now and the and that equity split is fixed all the way whereas for this model okay the equity split is is it changes depending on uh, which quarter it is so for example you know, fixed model, let's say if I put in 100 uh, slices of value and Novi puts in 100 slices of value and let's say in quarter two, Anson puts in 100 slices of value. So if so, by right, the, the fair speed would have been 66 and 30, 33 point, uh, 34, 66 and 34 because over here he put 200, 200 slices of value where over here he put 100 slices of value, okay? So in a fixed model, right, with, uh, with a 50-50 speed, it's not fair, right? And in the long run, when things are not fair, when things are not win-win, okay, um, partnerships uh, tend to fall, uh, tend to falter, okay. Just like how in my first, like first four businesses I've done, it's always because of partnership issues, right? And had I picked up this book like five years earlier, um, I would have avoided a lot of pitfalls and a lot of mistakes um, that a lot of partnerships make, okay. Now, so what does he uh, propose instead? He says, okay, so let's say if you put 100 units of value, 100 units of value, so over here, in total, you put 300 units of value. So this person should get 60%. This person should get 40%. And that will be a fair split because it's based on the it's based on how much you deserve to get. Okay, a, a fair split. Okay, and uh, yeah. So so this is a way better um, split compared to um, a, a a fixed split where because at the end of the day. Nothing is truly equal. Nothing is truly fair. Like a lot of people say, oh, uh, uh, mine is uh, sales and marketing. So it's a very important role. Oh, mine's operations. Operations is also a very important role. Without sales, but you say, without sales and marketing, there's no need for operations. But without operations, even with a market, you know, so they always, everyone will always um, tell the, their partner that, oh, their role is more important, right? And that's where a lot of conflicts arise. And when you read this book, Slicing Pie, which is an amazing book, um, it will be able to solve all these um, questions for you, okay? Now, so um, here's the thing about slicing pie. In this book, so this is the basic concept, right? But in this book, he explains, okay, how do you calculate, like, like okay, now we understand, okay, if you put in uh, how much of value, you should get back how much of value, right? But how do we calculate how much of value? How much is money worth? How much is time worth? How much is in uh, our ideas worth? How much is uh, uh, furniture and all that worth? How much is... Um, intellectual property, how much is, um, you know, there's so many variables that come into play. And like, how do you terminate someone? How do you finance the pie and all this kind of stuff? So if you want to learn more, you can read this book. It will cover in more detail. And I'm so excited to interview Mike Moyer very, very shortly. What's up? This is Elric Ong, and today I'm here with Mike Moy Moyer, and he is, he is an American entrepreneur, author, adjunct lecturer at Northwestern University, and adjunct associate professor at the University of Chicago, Booth School of Business. He has written eight books in support of achieving success in advanced education and business, including How to Make Colleges Want You, which he wrote in 2008, and Slicing Pie, which he wrote in 2012. The letter of which outlined his strategy for dividing equity in startup companies, and I just read this book last week, and honestly, it's, 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 it's a game changer. I believe that every startup, every partnership should read this book, right? 
And had I read this five years earlier, I think I would have avoided a lot of um, pitfalls that most entrepreneurs um, face. So welcome to the show, Mike. Thanks. I get that a lot. People wish they'd, they'd read it earlier. So <laughs> glad you found it now, though. You're still young. You got more ventures ahead of you, right? Yeah. So maybe you can share what is Slicing Pie about a rough overview so that the audience can have a bit of context. And yeah. Slicing Pie is an equity model for dividing up equity in early stage companies. And the problem with equity splits today is, for the most part, and then Slicing Pie has been around for 10 years, but the problem with most equity splits is they rely heavily on our guesses about future events, our predictions of future events. Mm-hmm. Who's going to put money up? Who's going to do the work? Whose ideas are more valuable than others? So we have to predict what these things are going to be in the future. Well, nobody that I know can predict the future very well. So mm-hmm. you're automatically going to pick the wrong number. So what Slicing Pie does, instead of picking, on, picking it based on future events, it, picture, picks it, based on, it splits it based on actual events. So you won't know until the end of your, until you reach break even or series A, what your equity is going to be. The good news is in Slicing Pie, whatever it is, it's going to be exactly right. Whereas a traditional split, you know what, you, what you're going to get in advance. The problem is no matter what number you get in advance, it's going to be the wrong number. Mm. So the best way to understand it is the game of blackjack. Do you know how to play blackjack? Yeah. So let's pretend that you and I are going to play blackjack together as a team, not opponents, but as a team. And we're going to split the winnings 50-50 because we're friends. Mm. So you go to the table. They have gambling in Singapore? Yeah, yeah, they, they use. <laughs> we go to sing, we go to, we go to the table. We each put a dollar on the same hand of blackjack. We don't know if we're going to win. We don't know how much we're going to win. We don't know how long it's going to take to win. The future is unknowable. What we know for certain, though, is that we each bet a dollar. Mm-hmm. So the dealer deals two aces. So we want to split the aces and double down. But I'm out of money and you're not. So you put two more dollars down to cover our bets. Now you've bet three dollars and I've only bet a dollar. We still don't know if we're going to win or how much we're going to win or how long it's going to take to win. We still can't tell the future. What we know for certain, though, is that you bet three and I bet one. If we win... Does our original 50-50 split sound fair to you? No, uh, if I, pay, I put three, I should be in three, right? Yeah. Right, you should have 75%. You should, you should be 75-25. That's yeah. a logical, obvious, unambiguous conclusion that your share of the winnings should be based on your share of the bets. So right. in a startup, it's exactly the same thing. Only we're betting time and money and facilities and supplies and equipment. We're always betting on the future outcome of the company. And our bets are always equal to the fair market value of the contribution. So if you're worth $100,000 a year and I don't pay you $100,000 a year, you're betting $100,000 in unpaid compensation. You're not betting more than that. You're not betting less than that. You're betting exactly that amount. So Slicing Pie takes these bets into account and keeps track and then divides up equity based on that. That's that's how the basic model works. Yeah. I, I loved it when I, I read the book about fix and fleet, uh, fix and fight, because I I agree. Like that was exactly the same issues I faced uh, with the first four businesses I run. So like um, because at the start we will say okay I, I own thirty percent you own twenty percent you own forty percent and all that right, and because the, the thing in life is that nothing's truly fair nothing's truly equal like it, um let's say if if two partners go go fifty one forty nine or something, sometimes this person will feel hey um. Accounting is more important than sales. Some people feel, oh, sales is more important than finance, you know? Or, and, and so they, they always feel that they contributed more to the company than they actually did. Yeah, than they actually did. And what Slicing Pie does is that it's a dynamic model where um, the equity changes over time. So you could start yeah. off with, with um, a 50-50 split, but at the end of maybe one year or two years, if the one person doesn't contribute as much, it could end up being a 75-25 split. And it would be a very fair... Um, it'll be a very fair split. And right. so if anyone wants to get his book, you make sure you go to Amazon, search Slicing Pie. It's only like $10. It's the, it'll be the best. If, if you are a founder or if you ever want to have a partner or anything, this will be the best $10 you ever spend. Yeah. Thanks. And There's in- a couple of things you said there I want to respond to that are they're interesting. One thing is you mentioned fix and fight. Fix is when you set, this, set the equity split in stone and then you fight about it later. Yeah. One thing I realized is just because we agreed to something doesn't make it fair. Yeah. So in Blackjack, we agreed to 50-50 and we could have had our lawyers look at it and we could have signed the contract and been a sound mind and body, but that didn't make it fair. Just because it's legal doesn't make it fair. Right. It's fair that you're for each other wings. And one of the things I've noticed in, in, since doing this is you said life isn't fair and that's totally true. In most areas of life, things aren't fair because we can't quantify them. But in right. business, we can quantify everything. 
everything can be expressed in dollars and cents. Ideas, facilities, supplies, they can all be expressed in dollars and cents. And therefore we know exactly what the contributions were. And because it's quantifiable, we can always come up with a fair answer. So this is one of the areas that, that when you look at it objectively, you see that it can be fair. Yeah. And like his, his, his book, it's like a playbook. It's like a handbook that tells you, okay, ideas are worth this much. Uh, salary is worth this much. Uh, yeah. uh, if someone contributes cash, it's worth this much, etc. So So um, okay, there was one, one chapter, chapter I read, which is about uh, baking the pie or freezing the pie. Now, are they the same thing or are they different? Freezing and baking the pie? Yeah. So um, I call it baking the pie, which is terminating the agreement. So slicing okay. pie works from day one, inception of the business, through break even or series A. Once the company has enough cash to pay people, it can pay people instead of using slices. A slice is, is, is a fictional unit of, of, of risk, like a, try, like a poker chip. So every time you bet, you're adding slices to the pie. When you don't have to bet anymore because I'm paying you or I'm reimbursing your expenses, the betting stops and the pie naturally stops accumulating slices and you bake the pie and issue you know, common shares or whatever that your country allows. Mm -hmm. um, so terminating, freezing, baking it all the same thing. Mm -hmm. So why do you think that it should be baked rather than continue being a dynamic model all the way? So if, I, if we start a company together and I gave you a million shares and I take 50,000 shares, I've given us the exact same amount of value because they're both worth zero. Mm -hmm. So when our company is worth zero, shares are meaningless. It doesn't, you know, we can't figure out, we can't calculate how many shares people need, deserve because there's no underlying value to the shares. We're just dividing by zero. Mm -hmm. So what slicing pie does, is it takes into account relative contributions of the bets people make. When the betting stops, that means the company has created enough value to generate revenues or generate investment. And therefore the shares can be priced somewhat accurately based on the investment or the, the, uh, the break-even evaluation. So once we have a dollar, and see if it's a dollar per share, I know if you contributed hundred dollars worth of value, I can give you hundred shares theoretically. That, would, that doesn't really work very well in practice. But once I have a dollar price for the shares, it no longer makes sense. So what's happening is it's during this very volatile, very ambiguous time in the beginning where everyone's making contributions you know, as fast as they can to get up to a break-even point or a series A, and that's when slicing pie applies. So beyond slicing pie, you can, of course, still use stock and stock options and allocations, but the underlying share price becomes your mechanism, not the slicing pie model. Okay, so, the sh so okay, got it, yeah. And um, so when preparing an agreement based on the terms in slicing pie, how do lawyers go about that? Like, do they refer to the slicing pie handbook or how do they make an agreement? On that? Well, at its core, slicing pie is a decision-making model. It's just how to make better decisions. So we can decide on whatever we want to on our equity split. What slicing pie does is it gives you the fair answer. Mm -hmm. So all equity splits change over time. So you know you and I can go into business and we change our mind later and change the split and change the split and fight about it, whatever. Slicing pie gives you the logic to make the changes. Now making changes in different jurisdictions all over the world can be more or less difficult depending on what the what the what the laws are. So some places they, they issue a tax, for instance, when shares are issued, regardless of the underlying value. Some, uh, some require you to issue shares up front. So there's a number of different sort of flavors of laws that exist. And there's a number of different flavors of slicing by agreements. So for instance, in an LLC, which is very popular in the United States, you can build the slicing by logic into the operating agreement. And then when the slicing by terminates, it'll simply automatically adjust the membership interests. Okay. In a C Corp, for instance, we would use uh, vesting. And I don't mean time-based vesting, I mean slicing pie vesting. So in a C-Corp, we could say, you get 10,000 restricted shares and I get 10,000 restricted shares. We're equal, it doesn't matter because the shares have no value. But when the pie freezes, it says, oh, it's actually a two-thirds, one-third split. So 10,000 of your shares would vest and 5,000 of my shares would vest, I mean 15,000 total now, and you'd have 10,000, I'd have 5,000. So it's, it's vested according to slicing pie. Time-based vesting has no place in slicing pie or really anywhere. It's kind of a ridiculous concept if you put your head to it. But uh, so slicing pie becomes a best, best mechanism. But in different countries, there's different ways of doing it. And many uh, accountants and lawyers in different countries have actually gone to their taxing bodies and have approvals made on slicing pie. Like, like for instance, in Belgium, they've sent it to, uh, to the taxing authority and the, the slicing pie has kind of been approved for use and in the Netherlands and in England. So a lot of places do that. Um, 
So, you know, some countries have the luxury of being able to go right to the tax authority. I've never heard of slicing pie backfiring in terms of taxes or corporate structure. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, if we have a deal for 50-50 mm -hmm. and we use slicing pie, our agreement says 50-50, our legal agreement says 50-50, and slicing pie tells us it's 60-40. Well, all I have is a legal right to be a dick. Yeah. It's not fair that I have no moral, you know, right to be a jerk. I was, yeah. you know, I, but I can I can enforce that 50-50 agreement. And if I do, and you go to an arbitrator or a judge, they're likely to say, "Gosh, you're using a logical system to divide up equity, so this would prevail." No such, no such thing as a as a, as a non-dilutable share. So. Um, legal agreements um, can be formed around slicing pie in all different different ways, and it's done. All, I have lawyers on my website from all over the world, except Singapore. I don't have them from Singapore. They come and go. They're, they move around. They're very. They move around a lot there. This, this, this Singapore lawyer. Cool. And um, so, how, so how often do you calculate the pie? Like, how often do you calculate the speed? Is it every month or every quarter or every year or how often do you do that? Different lawyers and accountants like to do it different ways or different people. It's, it's really, a, it's up to you. Um, one thing that slicing pie requires you to do is track your inputs, track your compensation that you're not being paid, track your expenses that you're not being reimbursed. These are things that most companies track anyway. Most companies track their payroll. Most companies track their expenses. Startups tend to not do that because they're not spending any money. But by tracking what you're not spending, it gives you really clear insight to what your business costs are and what they would be if you had the money. So if you want to track on a, you know, an hourly basis, you can do that. If you want to track on a weekly basis, you can do that. If you want to track on a monthly basis, you can do that. You know, if you're worth $120,000 a year and you're working full time, I can pay you $10,000 a month in salary. If I can't pay you salary in cash, I'll pay in slices instead. I'll use slices instead. So the allocation in theory is happening every minute of every day. But in, you know, in, in practice, it's whatever, you're, whatever you can tolerate. But usually people on my software, you can track it. You know, you can, there's a lot of reoccurring things you can put in there. People track sort of in real time as they add things. Most people like log on once or twice a week and log their contributions. Think about it as filling out an expense report or a time card. It's not mm -hmm. really complicated. Yeah, he has a he has a software called uh, when you go to slicingpie.com, you can go and go and use his software, and that will track like um you know all the things that you have contributed to the company, and then what what your split um deserves to be. So definitely yeah, so go and check it out, and you can hire the real calculus in real time. Yeah, yeah. And what if let's say you're making revenue from the get go, like uh, and you're distributing dividends from the start. So how would that work? Like if let's say this company is profitable from day one, okay, so. With a dynamic model, it will mean that the dividends will be different every time. Like, okay, uh, this month, it's 60-40. They'll split the dividends 60-40. The next month, it will be 30-70. Another month, it can be 25-75. So, is that how it will work? If, if, uh, no, profit comp dividends aren't compensation. So, it's really important to remember that your salary is not your dividend. Mm -hmm. You're not paying people from dividends. You're paying dividends from dividends, from profits. And profits mm -hmm. only happen when you pay salaries. So, let, so let's pretend that you own some Apple computer shares mm -hmm. and you go to work for Apple computer and your boss comes in and says, guess what? We found out that you own Apple computer shares. So we're not gonna pay you your salary. What mm -hmm. would you say? It's two separate things. Uh, I own the two shares. Separate things, I, right. Yeah, two separate right. things. So if I'm not, so it's Apple Computer will pay you a dividend on your Apple shares only after your salary and everybody else's salary are paid. Mm -hmm. So you can't have profits and your salaries are paid. So what you would do is you would do your split, whatever that happens to be. You would pay your salaries first and what's left over is profit. And you yeah. can retain that profit as retained earnings or you mm -hmm. can distribute to shareholders. Mm -hmm. As for the question, if you're profitable from day one, if you and I get together and from the instant we start, we're profitable. We're making money, we're paying ourselves. Mm -hmm. We both bet equal amounts of nothing to start mm -hmm. that company. So we're automatically 50-50 partners because we both bet equal amounts of nothing. If, mm -hmm. you, if, you bet, if you all bet nothing and you're just profitable from the start, then you're equal shareholders. Okay. But if you bet $100 and I bet nothing, then you own essentially the whole thing um, okay. on the first day. But most companies don't start that way. They, they take some weeks or months or years even to become profitable. So, but, uh, okay, let's say if it's profitable from day one, okay? Let's say it's a, maybe a coaching business or service-based business, which is very easy to be profitable from day one. Um, do you bake the pie immediately or do you still go through a dynamic model and like, yeah. I would, I would bake the pie immediately. So if it was my company and I was collecting revenues from day one, I wouldn't cut you in the pie. I would just pay you your fair market salary. Mm -hmm. 
And you'd be perfectly happy with that because it's as much money as you want. Now, you might want to have equity in my company, just like you might want to have equity in an Apple computer. But you can't buy the equity until you have the, the cash on hand. But if I'm not paying you, then I owe you equity. But as long as I'm paying you, you should be perfectly happy. Got it. So if, let's say a company, okay, so, so, okay, so let's say if I were to buy a company, okay, like maybe own 20% of a company. Um, but let's say, if, okay, for example, let's say right now I own a few businesses. I own a tuition business. I own a social media marketing agency. So I own like 20% of their company. And what I contribute to them is not so much cap cash, uh, but I contribute more in terms of advisory and in terms of connections, okay? Um, and, a, and a line of credit, if they ever need cash, I will lend the company cash, not the entrepreneur, but the, but the company. So um, how, how does the slicing pie model work in this scenario if I'm buying, yeah? Well, if you're, if you're loaning the money, then it's not a bet. You're getting the money back. So it's not part of the slicing pie model. Okay. In some cases, you can do, if the company is using, using slicing pie and you loan the money, they would pay you back your payments. If, you, if they skipped the payment, they would, that would become part of the pie. Mm -hmm. um, but if they're not paying you for your advisory role, then that could become part of the pie. It mm -hmm. requires the underlying company to be, to be using slicing pie. So as an advisor, advisor is just a mini employee. Mm -hmm. An investor is basically an employee whose job it is to invest money. So if you say, I'll give you $50,000 and you don't cough up the money, then you're not doing your job. Mm -hmm. um, so it depends on, you know, as the money is consumed through your job, and your time is consumed, your money is consumed, that's when it turns into slices, as long as the company is using slices. But if they're profitable already, then they should just be paying you your, your, your rate. But if let's say they're profitable already, but instead of paying me uh, uh, cash, they choose to pay me in equity instead. So how, how do I go about that? So if they're profitable, that would imply that they've created some value and mm -hmm. their company is worth something. It's not worth zero anymore. So the underlying stock price would be the price at which they give you shares. Now that's common, but it, there's, there's a problem with it. And the problem is this, if I owe you a thousand dollars and I wanna pay you in equity, I've gotta get those shares from somebody. So I can buy them from somebody and pay them a thousand dollars and get the shares and give them to you, which would be an inefficient transaction. Mm -hmm. Or I can create more a thousand dollars with more shares, which dilutes everybody down. Right. So paying someone in equity is not a really practical solution to this problem. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. I don't really like it. Slicing pie has, is, a, is a tool because, because the, you, you, the shares are created as the pie builds. But once the pie is worth something and shares have been issued, paying someone equity either dilutes down the equity or creates an inefficient transaction, which is why people use stock options and things like that, which means I'm not actually paying you. I'm giving you the right to pay me. So um, the best thing that I've found is to give people the option of buying in. So when I don't pay you, I conserve that cash and I can give you the option to buy shares from the company if I'm issuing new shares. But I got to make sure that all the rest of the shareholders are good with that kind of dilution on an ongoing basis. If I need cash, then that's the one way to do it. If I don't need, if I, if I have cash, I should use cash. If I need cash and I'm worth something, I should finance through, you know, through debt so I don't have to issue more equity. But if I really want to issue equity for, for whatever reason, then I can do it by allowing someone to buy in. Okay, so for example, if let's say it's a it, um the business is profitable, um the person wants to come in and wants to get equity, so he should buy the shares at the market rate. Is that what right. you're saying? Yeah, as long okay. as they're available. But really, and, in reality, is if my company is profitable, I shouldn't feel pressure to get anybody on the bottom in the equity pool. If I'm okay. profitable, that implies that I can pay my salaries. Mm -hmm. So if you're worth, if you want two hundred thousand dollars a year and I can pay your salary and still be profitable, I should just pay you and then you're happy. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of pressure. We feel like there's a lot of pressure to, to give equity to people. Equity doesn't create motivation. It reflects motivation. What mm -hmm. I mean by that is if I give you equity, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna be more motivated to work harder because I'm just, if I'm paying you and giving you equity. If you buy equity, that means you believe in the company and you wanna invest your own money into it. So I think there's a lot of pressure these days to give away equity or cut people in, but you don't have to if, if, you, if you're profitable. Um, but I can also, I can always sell you my share, my personal share, for instance. So if I own 100%, you can buy shares for me personally instead of to the company. So that won't dilute either one of us. Mm -hmm. Equity is a kind of a misunderstood friend in this, in this world. Okay, so, so I don't, okay, I don't quite understand. So like, you, you don't recommend um, paying someone equity. Uh, like, but why if that person is a strategic partner who you know, let's say if you give, like, if you work 20, 80 with him or something, he can really help you scale the business two times, five times, 10 times, then it would be worth it to 
you know, kind of like give him that equity. So maybe, or even you, or you just pay him. Why can't you just pay him? Mm-hmm. But what if he's not motivated by cash? <clears throat> Who's not motivated by cash? The person who comes in. The reason they wouldn't be motivated by cash is because they think the equity is going to be worth more than the cash, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So in that respect, you want to give them the opportunity to buy into the company by foregoing cash in exchange for the underlying price of the cash, of, the, of the equity. Got so uh, you wouldn't want to just give them the equity hour. You know, if they want to, if, if, if their bill was $100,000 a year, you could mm-hmm. give them the opportunity to buy $100,000 a year, $100,000 worth of shares at your price. Mm-hmm. Um, but if the company's profitable, it's better just to pay them and be done, be done with it. If, if, they, if they can't ever be motivated by cash, they can start their own company. The point is, you don't have to do these kind of partnerships if you're profitable. If you're not profitable, then you got to do these kind of partnerships and within their bets are what they're spending on the company. Um, if your company is just barely break even, that's not really profitable. So if you're a comfortable, profitable company, then make all, by all means, you should, you should put out to buy services rather than give, give your company, company away. Cool. Let's talk about financing the, the pie. So like when, let's say you get investors on board, um, how does the math work out? So yeah, does it, does it follow the standard startup model, which is like, let's say if they buy 10% for $1,000 or something. So that means uh, for like, say they buy 10% for $100,000. So that means the whole company is worth, um, like, the slicing pie follow the exact same model as a, as a normal startup. It does at, at the point of, of, of capital investment. Okay, what Slicing Pie does is it reduces the need for capital. So you can use bets instead of capital. Mm-hmm. This, so the first group of investors are people who aren't taking salary, who aren't getting their expenses reimbursed. That's just, those are kind of called grunts. They're part of the Slicing Pie model. Yeah. The second type of investor is someone who invests their own money in amounts that are too small to fund your operation. So like $1,000. You wouldn't give someone X percent for $1,000 because that would set your price. If I give you 10% for $1,000, that would imply that I'm worth $10,000. And my nine thousand dollars in leftover equity, I can't pay anybody with because it's not enough to do anything with. So people are going to continue to make bets. So I got to avoid setting a valuation. I call it a premature valuation when it's too small to fund your operation. Those types of investors, those angel investors, should get convertible notes. A convertible note will push off the valuation until a later date until you raise serious financing, venture venture capital. Someone who invests millions of dollars to pay salaries and cover expenses, that person is doing what's called a priced round. And that's the price your shares. So if you put a million bucks in for 10%, that implies you're worth $10 million. Uh, so you want to negotiate the pre-money valuation. The inputs to the pie do not dictate the value of the pie. They've got nothing to do with the value of the pie. The value of the pie is the value created. The, the bets on the table don't have anything to do with it. So the key is to use slicey pie to build your company up to as much value as you can and then do a major raise or, or loans along the way. But you, you know, one thing I see a lot is people you know, selling their mom 10% for $10,000. That this creates all kinds of problems. If I set a premature valuation and then pay you with equity that has a value, underlying value, you can be taxed on that value. Mm-hmm. If I set a pre- premature valuation and you were in, my mom buys 10% for $10,000, my company's worth $9,000, $10,000 now. If your bill is $20,000, I don't have enough to pay you now. Could you repeat that? If- so if I set a value of $10,000 to 100% of my equity, Mm-hmm. And you send me a bill for twenty thousand dollars. I can't mm-hmm. pay you in all of my equity because it's not mm-hmm. worth that much. Correct. See that problem? So yeah, I've just given you the entire company for free. Mm-hmm. You know, so so setting a premature evaluation creates all kinds of problems with your math. So the key is use slicing pie as much as you can to account for bets, and then use angel investors' convertible notes until you have enough value to raise a serious round of money. Got it. Okay. So okay, let me understand a little bit better. So okay, um, in a dynamic model, which is the slicing pie model. The, the, the percentage of the equity keeps changing, right? Yes. Um, when an investor comes in, let's say uh, an angel investor comes in uh, and buys 100000 like invests $100,000 for 10% of the company, is his investment also subject to the dynamic uh, model or is it like his, he will always own 10% and then like the, the dynamic model is the dynamic model? You get if he's giving you $100,000, you shouldn't do a fixed split for him. You should do a convertible note. Basically, he should give you a loan that would convert later on. Okay. If you make the mistake of doing a 10% deal for him, then everyone else shares the remaining $900,000, regardless of what's put in. And so, so in other words, your risk is unlimited. His risk is limited to 10%, to $900,000. So you've capped the, the exposure of the investor while leaving your exposure unlimited. 
uncapped. So that, that creates kind of this unfair situation. So the best thing to do is give them a, a convertible note, unless you're raising enough to pay your salaries. Once you pay salaries, then I'm no longer making any bets. I'm no longer taking any risk, personal risk. I'm just getting paid a salary. Mm -hmm. So my pie would freeze and that would be my share. Okay. So if let's say it's a convertible note, is, so then will he be subject to the... Okay, maybe you can explain what a convertible note is first. Or okay. Maybe, oh yeah, maybe you what, can a convertible, what a convertible note is, it's, it's basically a loan. I give you $100,000 a year. You pay me back in five years. Mm -hmm. But if you raise venture capital money, then my $100,000 will convert at the same terms that convert that, that venture capital money. So if you set a dollar for share and sell 5 million shares, I'll be able to buy 100,000 shares with my money at that time. Mm -hmm. So it, it sets the terms of the big raise, not the little raise. Mm -hmm. So angel investors and company founders aren't qualified to set a valuation for a company. It's just made up. Professional VC investors are much better qualified to set a valuation for a company than an angel investor is. So rather than setting a valuation, you push that back to the uh, Series A investment. So the, the loan just stays alone until it converts to equity. Cool. So, so if let's say it was a convertible note, so is the angel investor, um, will they be subjected to the dynamic splits and everything? Dynamic in the sense that his valuation or her valuation will be determined later, later on. Okay. Um, but it won't, won't be changing all the time uh, because he, they, don't, they don't know what it's going to be. So a convertible note is a form of dynamic investment. You don't know what it's going to be up front, but you know that when, this, when the valuation is set, you'll get your, your shares. Only people that are participating in the pie. There is something called a, a slicing pie loan. A slicing pie loan is when I loan you $100,000 and you make payments on it. If you skip a payment, that goes into the pie as slices. Mm. If you continue paying, you just pay it off. When you reach break even, you can pay me off and we're, we're even. So it's a different kind of financing, but it's kind of in between an angel investment and a, and a, and a slicing pie participant. Awesome. I, I love how you went into such detail. Like, like you've really, like you can, I can tell that you really thought this through, like every aspect of it. And I don't think there's anyone on this planet who's put more thought on this to me than, than I have. <laughs> yeah. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people met, you know, lawyers and advisors make their, you know, have thoughts on this. But this is literally the, the most thing I've, I've been thinking about is this, non-stop for 10 years you know yeah like okay t tell me more about the passion behind this what made you so motivated uh, do you have a bad partnership or something that's why i said you know what one thing i have had bad partnerships um mm -hmm. i started a company once where my first company i did it all cash i was petrified to get anybody in my next company i did such a convoluted financing deal it didn't even make sense even when i read it today it doesn't make sense and then, so i wound up going out of business because of it and then i did a deal with a guy where I gave him 25% of the equity and he never produced anything. It was too hard. So I could give back the equity and I gave it to another guy 75% of the equity to do the same project. He did it in two weeks. So now he had 75% of the equity, I had 25%. I thought it was a huge job, it was no job. So I gave away all my company, you know, so it was just constantly. And then I did another deal once where the company's still in business and I signed a deal that allowed my partner to buy back my shares at par value and. So he bought my shares back for a few thousand dollars and sold them for probably hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. And it's, it never made sense to me. This whole idea of trying to predict the future and, and, uh, and can capture value up front it never made sense to me. I know why people want to do that. They want to get as much as they can for themselves, but it doesn't make any logic. But, but slicing pie isn't my idea in the sense that I invented the concept of fairness I just distilled the model, the concept of fairness to a point where you can understand it. Mm -hmm. And you think about the blackjack table, the blackjack table results, you know, 75, 25 for $3 versus my dollar. That's not ambiguous. That's not unclear. That's, 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 that's totally logical. Anything I add into that narrative is just me making up stuff for the future. Yeah. The facts of the table, the, fact, the facts are, are, are clear, 75, 25, that's, that's unambiguous. We can mm -hmm. count everything. And I realize you can count everything in a startup. Everything can be counted. You know, people say, you know, what's the value of my idea? Well, try to sell your idea. If you can sell it, you know the value. If you can't sell it, it's either worthless or it's priceless. Mm -hmm. You know, so everything should be, have, have a value. Most companies simply get invoices and pay their bills. You know, if I, you know you're, a, you're a consultant, you're a coach. People mm -hmm. pay you for your ideas, right? Mm -hmm. so, you, so you give someone, one of your clients an idea and they go out and make a million dollars for it. You don't go sue them later on and ask for more of that money, do you? 
No, because they already paid Because right, they already paid you. Right. So that payment is your fair market value. And that's what you're betting. If you're not paid that amount, that's your bet. So uh, I remember, you know, trying to put, I used an early version of slicing pie for one of my startups. Um, that was, it wasn't, didn't have the kinks worked out of it. But I had an employee who worked for two weeks and then stopped showing up for work. And he sent me a bill for $10,000 or $8,000. And then he sued me to collect the money. I didn't have any, I didn't have money to pay him. And the arbitrator in the state of Illinois took five minutes to look over the, the deal and said, this is clearly a, an agreement that makes sense. And she, so, so she let me off the hook for the money. I didn't have to pay the money. Mm. Um, you know, one thing that's important is when people walk away from your company, um, there's often unfair payouts. Like you're, if you're our CTO and you up and quit on us, I might have to buy you out if I gave you a fixed share. So the people who quit early on are often the only people who ever make any money at all in the company, which is a shame. So slicing pie, the, 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 the logic is if you walk away from your bet by getting fired for a good reason or terminating for no good reason, you're basically forfeiting your pie, your slices, because you're walking away from the bet. Just like in blackjack, if you walk away from the table, they're not going to hunt you down and give your money back. They're gonna, you're, you've walked away from your bet. Mm -hmm. But if you're fired for, good, for no good reason, like I just fired you for no good reason, or you resign for good reason, then you keep your slices on the pie. Your bet stays. Mm -hmm. But th that logic reflects... Just logic of fairness. It's not a it's not a scheme or a deal. It's just what what happens in in, in life if you walk away from your bets. So that that, that are, the concept of betting and the concept of, of recovery just is, reflects the logic of, of fairness. There's there's only one version of what's fair. It's not what you think it is or what I think it is. It's what it is based on the facts. Mm -hmm. At the uh, at the same time, value is subjective, right? So uh, you know, to some people, this can be like. So, but, but it's good that you have a playbook that says like, this is the value of this, this is the value of this. But that's based on, it's also based on arbitrary numbers because like we can't really put a value on time or we can't, like we can't, we can put a market value to it, but value at the end of the day market. Is, you put a fair market value out. You can't value the future at the time. So this conversation we're having now, I'm not paying you and you're not paying me, right? Yeah. But someone's going to watch this video and take this idea and go make millions of dollars on it. They owe us nothing because we'd agreed to do this for free. Yeah. So the fair market value of our time, you know, if you hired us as consultants, would be so I can't, I can't assess the future value of my time. I can only assess the fair market value of my time. Mm -hmm. So it's not subjective. If you, if I want to hire you for $100,000 a year and you want $200,000 a year, we don't have an agreement, right? Yeah. So we got to come to some agreement. If you can't come to an agreement, we don't work together. If mm -hmm. we can, then the fair market's been set. If I want to buy this thing, and it costs $15, and I agree to that, and everyone else agrees to it, and the fair market set. Now, the benefit I'm going to get from this thing is much more than 15 bucks. Mm -hmm. But Microsoft or whoever made this logic tech isn't going to come out for the extra money. So mm -hmm. I can't say that the, my future value is what matters. What, all I can say is my current value matters. I think of an attorney, for instance. Mm -hmm. Attorney will charge you 500 bucks an hour to write an agreement. You go make millions on that agreement, he's not going to come after you to collect more money. So all we're setting is fair market value, because that, that's what our bet is. We can't say it's a bit more than that a time, but it's more, a bit more than that. Like you can't say in blackjack that your $3 bet is worth more than $3. It's only worth what it's worth. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So for like for the companies that I own, right? Um, let's say those that I own 20% off. Um, on, on like I mean I, I read somewhere in their book they say that for advisory, they shouldn't be paid more than two hundred dollars per hour for their time. You thought it would make it unfair for the other grants. Um but at the same time, I feel that if let's like two hundred dollars per hour might not be um might not be enough motivation to coach that company or to consult that company. You're so right. what would you advise it to do? Like what would you advise? I to? you read the book Slicing Pie. Did you read the yeah. English version of that book? Yeah, English. Yeah. So Slicing Pie has been translated into about a dozen different languages. Yeah. And uh, so for that reason, I haven't changed that book much. There's a book called the Slicing Pie Handbook, which is more updated. I no longer recommend capping the advisor's hourly rate in that book. Okay. Um, because it is what it is. You decide if it's worth 500 bucks an hour or a thousand bucks an hour. If you could, because someday you're going to pay the person. If you can't, if you don't think you can ever afford to pay that person a thousand bucks an hour, whatever they want, then, then don't hire them. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, you know, if, if you find someone who's worth a lot per, for, per hour, you can either pay them in cash or pay them in slices. But if you can't if you agree that it's worth what they're worth, then don't, don't hire them. So I don't I don't cap it at a thousand two hundred dollars anymore. Cool. Now that was just kind of an arbit that was at the time I wrote the book in two thousand twelve. Mm. I thought that made sense, but now I, I see that it doesn't make as much sense. Now cool. it's just what I'm talking about.
Okay. Yeah. The, the model is the same thing, but it's just the fair market value is what it is. I think this dynamic concept is, I mean, it's super interesting. I've never seen something like that. Were you the first person to come up with such a model? Uh, I was the only person that I know that ever wrote it, that ever reduced it to paper in the way that I did. Mm -hmm. At the time, there were no other equity books available. Now there's one other that's not very well reviewed online because um, mm -hmm. it uses a fixed approach. Mm -hmm. From time to time, people would say to me, oh, I tried to use a model like this with my company, um, but there's a few big sort of ingredients that are missing. Um, one of them is the setting fair market values. The other one is the recovery framework, how to get ready, equity back when someone leaves. Mm -hmm. And the, the most... Uh, the, the, the real magic that makes it work are these things called multipliers. Do you remember the multipliers from the book? Yeah, two and four. Yeah, two and four. So the problem that I had with my first company that I started without, with, with a slicing pie like model without the multipliers was because there's no difference between cash and non-cash, people just pushed all their expenses to me because I was the majority shareholder. They said, Mike should just pay all the expenses. Mm -hmm. And I did. So I just spent all my money. I went almost bankrupt spending all my money on expenses because there was no incentive for someone to put cash in the, in the company. Mm -hmm. Because cash and non-cash feel very different to people because they are very different. Mm -hmm. If I paid you $50 an hour to work for me and you wanted to buy a thing that cost $50, it would take you more than an hour to earn enough money. Mm -hmm. Because when I paid you, I'd pay employment taxes and social security taxes. When you receive the money, you'd pay income taxes. And when you bought the thing, you'd pay sales tax or VAT tax. So your hourly rate is reduced by what the cash transactions actually are. Mm -hmm. So you may actually have to work two hours to earn enough money to buy the thing. For that reason, I double cash for, uh, for slices. Right. So you get four slices per hour for, per dollar instead of uh, two slices per dollar. And two slices per dollar in, in, for non-cash reflects the fact you're taking a lot of risk. So those multipliers help smooth out cash and non-cash to make it more palatable to invest money. Cool. Um, you see, that slicing handbook, okay, so, so I'm just... Um, op I'm open for discussion, right? So, okay, so the slicing handbook is based on input. So, for example, if let's say um, this, uh, it's based on inputs and not outputs, uh, or not based on the results. So, for example, let's say if this this worker, okay, or this file, this partner spends ten hours to do a work, okay, but the value that he produces is X, and let's say for me, if maybe I only take one hour to produce the work, but the value that I produce is two X. So it, you know, like because there are some people right. are more productive than then what? So in this current model, you are saying that he should get 10 times more equity than me because he put in 10 times the amount of input. What right. do you think about that? So always think about this, not in terms of equity, always turn to and think of well, if you're paying cash, what would you do? If I find you to be 10 times as productive as somebody else, I would be sure to give you a raise, right? Because yeah. I want to retain you. Because if you're that right. productive, you're going to leave and go somewhere else. So right. I got to give you a raise to keep you. If I found someone who's 10% as productive as you, I give them a warning. So you're not doing your job properly. I give them another warning. Third mm -hmm. time they're fired, I get their slices back. I get their equity back because they're getting fired for good reason. So if you're not productive, you lose your job. If you're super productive, you keep your job or get a raise. Mm -hmm. So it's your job to be productive. So the same goes for what if I just, I'm padding my hours. I just, you know, charge an hour to the company as much as, you know, whatever I want. Sure, sure you can do that. But if you're not productive, you'll get a warning, the warning, then fired. Mm -hmm. So no matter what it transpires, Slicey Pie always protects you. Mm. So, but would you agree that um, if let's say people charge by the result rather than by the, by the output, rather than by the input, would you agree that that's a more fair, it's actually a more fair model? Sort, well, not necessarily. I can't always judge output. I can always buy the input. So I buy, <clears throat> I buy a hamburger flipper to make hamburgers for me. I pay him 15 bucks an hour. He makes 100 hamburgers. I charge $1.50 per hamburger. It's 150 bucks, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't, I can see the value. I, I can't say his 15 bucks, his birth created that $150 in value. I can't say that he created that value. It might've been the, the, the bun vendor or the, the lettuce that I got or the meat that I got. He could say, without me, you wouldn't have $150 in value. That can be said for anything. So I can't, I can't attach one person's performance specifically to an output. If I can, then I can give a commission on that thing or a finder's fee, like a sale, for instance. If I can attach it to a specific output, then I can pay on the output. So I can pay on the output of sales. But for, the, for a manager, it's very difficult for me to, to, to assess individual value to, one, to, 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 different, to the parts. So for instance, I have a sailboat mm -hmm. and it's a big sailboat. 
and the back of the mass is attached to the back of the boat using it, what's called a backstay. And there's a little pin that holds the backstay in place. Without that pin, the boat doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So that 50 cent pin is worth the entire boat. Uh -huh. An argument could make it's worth the entire boat because without the pin, it doesn't work. In yeah. fact, it's more important than the motor because I can't, if, the motor, if I don't have a motor, I can still sail the boat as long as I have that pin. So I can't, I guess, I can't say the value of the sailing experience is all due to that one little pin, but I can say the fair market value of the pin is $50, 50 cents, and I have multiple in the drawer because mm -hmm. it's replaceable. So output is important. So that pin's output is incredibly important. But the fair market value is all I can actually count. Because I can say that for the mast and for the sail and for the sailors and for the buoy, all that parts of the boat. Mm -hmm. So unless I can, if I can assess as exact output to a specific person, then I can pay a fee on it. So if I have a manufacturer, a manuf someone doing assembly, for instance, and mm -hmm. I can ch find a part rate, in which they assemble the, the parts, I could pay them per part, for instance. If I have a salesperson, I can measure the output specifically, the output specifically I can do a, a finder's fee or a commission. Um, so if you can't, and then that's still a fair market rate. The commission, you know, I got a million dollars in revenue. Well, the fair market rate is 10% commission, so it's $100,000. It's still a fair market rate. The salesperson could say, yeah, but you wouldn't be in business without me. Well, that's true, but I can also buy another salesperson for the same price as you. Because mm -hmm. I can buy another pin for the same price. Correct. Correct. Cool. Well, I think... To me, it's surreal, you know, because I just read the book last week and right now I'm talking to you, the author of the book. Um, it was an amazing experience. I, I, I like the discussion a lot. I've learned so much from you. And for all of you watching, I definitely recommend um, going to slicingpie.com and read. He's got free articles about it. He even spoke at Stanford University um, about the slicing pie model. Um, yeah, so everyone go to slicingpie.com. And Mike, what, what are your social media handles? How can people follow you? Um, at Slicing Pie on Twitter, um, on LinkedIn and Facebook. Um, it's, all, it's all on the website. You know, one thing that's important to know that Slicing Pie is free. It's free to use. There's spreadsheets online. Like you said, there's articles, there's videos. I want everyone in the world to use this model. You can mm -hmm. buy software, you can buy books, you can buy contracts, there's things to buy, but I don't want anyone to let the price get in the way of using the model. So mm -hmm. just make sure people know that they can use it. People from all over the world use it. In 10 years, I have found no one as you slicing pie, have a deal that's backfired on them. Everyone has been successful from an equity standpoint, creating a fair split. What I hear from lawyers is that 60 to 80% of all equity deals that are done traditionally wind up in dispute that requires legal intervention. So mm -hmm. slicing pie isn't an answer, it's the answer to making equity splits work. Awesome. Awesome, man. <laughs> yeah, I love the conviction that you have. And, and I truly believe that as well. I truly believe that if anyone, if any entrepreneur still, um, a, like still thinks that a fix and fight method is better than a dynamic model. I think if they read the book, they would definitely be, um, it would definitely change their mind. Yeah. And they either Thank don't so get much. it or they want to make it. They either, they, either, they either don't get it or they want to screw you. Correct. Correct. Yeah. It's like, or maybe they're just lazy to, you know, implement the new yeah. model. Yeah. Thank you so much for being on the show. I, uh, I loved it. And uh, for those of you who liked it, make sure you, you know, um, visit slicingpie.com and watch all his free videos, get the book, try the software, and you would you would definitely like it. And even if you are not an entrepreneur or you have ever thought of becoming an entrepreneur, just read the book and understand how he thinks. I think that that's very, very enriching as well. Thank you very much. I appreciate the nice things. Thank you. Thanks for having me.